Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and this is Bits of Architecture. So in this episode of the series, we're going to be talking about basic processor design. So what exactly do we need to build a processor? Now, specifically, we're going to be looking at uh, the major components that we need for a processor for a subset of the RISC-V instruction set, and we're going to use that as a starting point. Now, we're not really talking about, you know, how do we implement this in, say, an HDL like Verilog uh, in those low-level implementation details. We're going to start out with, say, the high-level organization. So what high-level components do we need and how do they fit together, right? How are they connected and how are they controlled? So one of the core things that we're going to need in designing this processor is this thing called a program counter. And our program counter is there to answer the question of um, how do we keep track of where we are in our program, right? What instruction are we executing right now? And what instruction are we going to execute next? So for a program counter, right, the input is the next program counter value. So basically, where are we going next inside of our program? And then our output is going to be the current program counter value. So where are we right now inside of a program? And we'll see how uh, this current PC and these, uh, uh, this next PC and where that comes from um, in some of these later slides. So alongside a program counter, we have our instruction memory. So remember, we have this concept of a stored program computer. So all of our instructions of our program are just stored someplace in memory. And when we want to execute them, we have to read them from this memory. Now to read them, right, we have to read them from this instruction memory. So our input is going to be a program counter um, value. So you can think of this program counter value as just an address, right? We're reading something from memory at a specific address. Now specifically, what are we reading? Well, we're reading our output right here, which is an instruction. So our program counter is really just an address and from our instruction memory, we're reading the actual instruction. So that 32-bit RISC-V instruction is coming out of our instruction memory, which is stored at this location, uh, which is this program counter value. Now, alongside our instruction memory, we also have these registers. And remember, registers are these pieces of memory that uh, we operate on with our instructions, right? Sometimes we store things into these registers. Uh, we use these registers as operands for instructions, and sometimes we load data from these registers and store them out to memory. So our inputs to our registers are going to be uh, three major things, right? We're going to have our register operands. So say, which registers do we want to read from right now? So for example, if we have say an add instruction, we might be reading from two of our registers, which are going to be the operands for this add. Maybe we're adding R1 and R2 together. Then we have uh, a destination register. So say, where do we want to store the result of say that operation, right? Adding R1 and R2, maybe we want to store it inside of R3. Now it's important to know that not every single instruction stores something to these registers right here, right? So, you know, remember something like a uh, store word instruction, right? We're storing something out into memory. So we'll read something from the register file, um, store it at some address right out in memory, right? Nothing gets written back into a register file in that case. So not every um, instruction uh, needs to store something to our registers here. And likewise, uh, we also have data, right? So data is what we might be writing into our register. So if we do say an add instruction, uh, we might be writing the result back into our registers here, right? So we're saying, say, which three registers we might using, so, or we might be using, so R1, R2, and R3. And then if we're writing something back into our registers, you know, that'll be on this data line. Now, as far as our outputs go for our registers, it's going to be data, right? Data is coming out of these uh, registers or this register file. So if, say, you know, we're accessing R1 and R2, so on the input here, we'll say which registers we're accessing, and our output will be the output of those registers, right? The contents of those registers, right? The actual data being stored in that memory. So that's that's roughly how we how we can view our registers. Now, along with our registers, right, which is this piece of memory, we have this much larger piece of memory typically, which is this data memory, right? So this is where all of our other uh, data is being stored for our programs, right? So we have our instruction memory where our programs are being stored, and then all the data that we're operating on is stored in this data memory. So um, our inputs to our data memory are pretty simple. We have an address saying which part of memory we want to access, and then uh, the actual data Right? And this is only for a store uh, operation, right? So we'll say where we want to access and what data we want to put at that address if we're doing a store. Now the output of our data memory 
in the case we're doing a load operation, is going to be the data that we're reading from a particular address. So if we're doing a store, we'll provide an address and data. If we're doing a load, right, so we're reading something from data memory, we just need to provide an address and we'll get an output of our data. Right, so all of these different components um, can be configured in these slightly different ways, depending on what we want to do and what instruction that we're executing. Now, we also have a number of these kind of helper components um, sprinkled around um, our architecture, right? And these help us do a number of kind of these core small operations um, inside of our processor. Now, at the, at the very core of a lot of our operations is this arithmetic logic unit, right? So how exactly do we perform our arithmetic operations? Well, we do it with this component called an ALU. And we use it for a couple different things. So we use it for manipulating our internal state. So how do we say what instruction we're going to execute next, right? Even without any, say, branches or jumps or anything. How do we actually move that program counter value along to access the next instruction? Well, we'll use something like an ALU to increment that program counter value. Likewise, with our instructions, like an add instruction or a mole instruction, or multiply, um, we need an ALU to perform that operation here. So our inputs in this case, we just have, say, two inputs to, the, to this ALU, and the output will be the result of whatever piece of arithmetic we told this ALU to perform, right? That's somewhat of an implementation detail that we'll get into later. Now, along with our ALU, another kind of core helper component uh, to help the coordination of all these different things and perform these operations is this thing called a multiplexer, often just called a MUX. So how do we select between different inputs, right? We often need to select between one of a number of different inputs um, to go to say the next stage or to go to, you know, maybe the next component. So we do that with this thing called a multiplexer. Now our inputs to our multiplexer, you know, we'll have this input one and input two, right? So we have these two values that we might want to select from. And our output is going to be the final result that we selected, right? Either input one or input two. And to decide which one of these inputs gets forwarded to the output, we use this, this select line down here. So we can say, do I want you know input one to be forwarded to output, or do I want input two to be forwarded to output, right? So that's what we use this select line for. It's selecting between you know, which of these inputs. So in this case, we just have uh, a, a MUX with two inputs here, but there are multiplexers with uh, many, many inputs. And you just need, say, more select lines down here to select exactly which one you want to choose to be forwarded to the output. But this is another kind of core helper component. Now, you may have wondered through all this, you know, it seems like that we're forgetting something. We're talking about how all of these different components need to be configured and how we need to select which operation we're going to be doing with the with our ALUs. You know, how do we decide if we're doing a read or a write? How do we know where a program counter is going next? And you're exactly right. So one other core piece of component that we're going to need here is uh, these control signals. So how do we tell our components what to do? we we'll tell them what to do based on these control signals. And these control signals are set based on our, on our instruction, right? Our instruction says what we want all of our components to do. Now we rely on these control signals to make that happen, to configure our different components in a way where they're going to do what we want them to do. So some examples of this are, you know, like I said, what operation should an ALU, an arithmetic logic unit perform? Should it do an add? Should it do a multiply? Should it do a divide? Right, that's going to be set by these control lines. Likewise, um, are we doing, say, a read or a write? So how do we how do we tell you know the rest of our process that we're doing a read or a write there? And same thing with our multiplexers. So how do we select which input that we're going to take and forward to the output? Well, that's going to be these select lines, which are coming off of these control signals, right? Based on what instruction that we're performing. Right, so all of these are handled in this control. Now it gets to a point where we have to eventually put all of these different components together, right? And what exactly is that going to look like? And it can be a little intimidating at first because we have many, many different things going on in a lot of different lines up connecting these different components. And we're going to be looking at this in much greater detail um, inside of the later videos. But here we can see, you know, kind of what this looks like for a subset of the RISC-V instruction set. And I'll go ahead and minimize my camera uh, so we can see the entire thing. So we can roughly go from left to right here and see how these different components are connected together. 
So starting out, we have say a program counter. So this is providing where we are currently inside of our program, which feeds into our instruction memory, right? Which is saying, you know, which instruction is located at this address from a program counter. After we get the result, right? Or basically the instruction read from our instruction memory, that goes off into a couple of places. So one, it goes to our registers. So we figure out which registers we need to access, but it also takes this red line down and goes to our control, right? To help set all of these control signals. From there, from our registers, we read the, uh, we read our register values and send them say to our ALU to perform some sort of operation. Um, from there, right, we might do something with memory. So we might be doing a read or write here. And those are going to be controlled by these control signals saying we're doing a mem read or maybe a mem write. Or, right, it, we might be going up here to this multiplexer, which is selecting between, say, data memory and the result of our ALU. So if we're loading something from memory, right, that'll be coming up here to the MUX. Or if we're doing, say, an arithmetic operation like an add, that'll be coming up here to our MUX, right? And we're going to select between those, and that's going to be fed back into a register. So the result of, say, an add operation getting stored into a register, or maybe the result of a load being stored back into our registers at some location. Now, up here above our instruction memory, we have more for bookkeeping related to where we're going next inside of a program. So you can see the common case right here is we just take our current program counter value and we add four to it, right? And this is going to be basically our four bytes. So 32 bits, right? The size of an instruction. So by default, we'll just add four to our program counter value to go to the next in instruction inside of our program. However, there are cases where we have say a branch, right? Where we need to go to this other ALU, right? And that's going to calculate, say, where we're going next in our program if we have, say, a branch. We're not just going down to the next instruction. And we have these control signals over here that, you know, come off of um, our control lines down here, which say, you know, is it a branch instruction, right? So we have this uh, line that says, are we doing a branch? And then we also have a line of this ALU here, you know, basically saying if we're doing, say, a branch of equal, right? So, you know, we're detecting, say, if the two numbers are equal here, as well if it's a branch to select between either our next instruction or maybe some other program counter value. And the selection between those goes right back into our program counter to be where we're going to go next inside of a program. So as you can see, there's quite a lot going on here. And this is something that we're going to be looking at and expanding on in these later videos. But that's gonna go ahead and do it for today. As always, I'm Nick. And I hope you have a nice day.